So I started out my career as a clinical social worker, specializing in psychiatric social work and in mental illness, mental health. And then I did a master's in family therapy. So I was practicing as a clinician as in family therapy, as a family therapist, and then found that, in fact, the children who were being brought into my therapy room with parents were really symptoms of the problems that parents had. So I decided to get rid of the children and only focus on the parents, on the couples, and started to do couple work. But because I'm South African and there wasn't any training at all, I began my training overseas. So I became accredited with ASECT, which is American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors and Therapists. And I then also did a doctorate um, in San Francisco, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Human Sexuality. So I'm a certified clinical sexologist and I have a doctorate in human sexuality. So that's what my background is. And from there, I built on to great interest and curiosities and specializations in other areas related to sexuality and intimacy. I was very involved at the beginning of the launch of Viagra. So I got trained in sexual medicine and launched Viagra in South Africa. I began a brand in South Africa in 1994 um, called Dr. Eve, and I got onto radio and television and media and became a very prolific activist for sexual health and sexual rights and justice and pleasure in South Africa. So my brand is now, it's like we're well, nearly 40 years old, and I promote, I still work under the brand of Dr. Eve, doing the same kind of work. But then my interest began to change as things went online and I became quite curious about what people were doing from an intimate point of view. And I then worked with a company called Ashley Madison and did research with them using their database and was very interested in cyber infidelity. And I wrote a book about that. And I also began to do a lot of training of other people around different management styles and skills therapeutically to manage cyber infidelity separately or differently from infidelity as such. And once I was working so intensely with cyber infidelity, I found that my skills were not sufficient. And I began to be interested in what really is going on with this incredible trauma that I was seeing as a result of cyber infidelity. And so I began training as a trauma therapist and so today I call myself an intimacy trauma therapist, where I blend in the sexuality all through a trauma-informed lens. So I trained under Bessel van der Kolk in Boston, and I then went on to train in sensory motor psychotherapy with Pat Ogden. And now I'm very interested in psychedelic medicine because I work with trauma and PTSD. So my range is, is very broad. My core remains around relationships, intimacy, or through a trauma-informed lens, and very interested, in, obviously, in what goes on online. Well, wow. <laughs> I just have to say, okay. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just so impressed with the, the landscape of your career and how it just kind of, it seems like one aspect of it was leading you right into the other aspect which led you right into the next aspect what a flourishing career and yeah. Yeah, congratulations it's really impressive yeah. um I've also been a huge activist for LGBTIQA people um started was part of a beginning of an NGO for transgender people and I teach at the university as well so I'm very broad and very committed to education and continue to be on radio and television as well. Incredible. I'm just curious, um, in that, in your career, you've had the opportunity to research and study and be part of so many things. Is there one subject or particular area that you were especially fond of or are especially fond of uh, that just really stands out to you as interesting or fascinating? You know, it always comes down to, to relationships and to intimacy. So back in the day when I was a sex therapist, because my primary passion, Ty, I mean, my primary passion is as a clinician. So I spend, you know, eight, nine hours of my day as a clinician in my therapy room. So my primary passion remains in the intimate connections of people and how people 
relate to each other in a very intimate way or try to. And sex for me is just one part of the intimacy. The other parts of intimacy are much more interesting for me. And because now I'm trained as a trauma therapist, I'm really, really interested in looking at the roots of where intimate attachments really happen. So I guess that for me is a big area of interest that still remains in terms of how early childhood trauma affects intimacy today and affects in turn the ability to be sexual in a healthy and pleasurable way. So that's one big interest. And right now as well, the, the big interest that I do have as the rest of the world does have, or the my world of sexology, is in gender identity. Very interested in what's going on in terms of trans and non-binary, and interested in what's going on from a clinical point of view. So that's the two areas of my interest, I guess, is, is the, you know, the intimate relationships of people and then the gender identity of, of young people. You know, the, when you take it down to intimacy, that is such a primal and foundational part of a human being. I think we can all relate to feeling unsatisfied with life when we don't feel intimately connected with people around us or that we care about and mm. live jasmine which is our platform I'm, I'm really actually excited to talk to you because uh, especially knowing that you have that background with ashley madison um, mm. which is different than live jasmine live jasmine is a cam site but there are some similarities in that a person is basically seeking to have certain intimacy needs met through the platform. And that's where I think that there we are similar. But what is it that forms an intimate connection? Because we have seen on our platform, it's it's actually almost um shocking sometimes how strong the bond between a model and a member can be when these two have never met in person and mm -hmm. they only communicate through this platform and the member is paying for their time. And yet these relationships will go on for 10, 15 years and mm -hmm. they are so strong and in depth. And I'm curious, how did that happen? What? Okay. Yeah. So that's a beautiful question. And I'm going to bring you two strands of it. And I think, let me start out with what I learned with Ashley Madison in my research with Ashley Madison, because it was actually surprising for me. When Ashley Madison launched in South Africa and their byline, as you know, is life is short, have an affair. And I refused to join forces with them when they invited me, when they came into the country, into South Africa, they invited me to be their representative. And I said, there's no way that I'm going to be supporting infidelity. And then after they launched, I had female clients coming into my therapy room who were happily married and had gone online onto Ashley Madison out of curiosity to start chatting to other married or people, men or women who were online as well. And they were coming into my therapy room saying, I don't know what's going on, but I've never felt happier in myself. I've never felt happier in my marriage. I don't feel guilty but I'm spending hours and hours online chatting to this random man or woman. And it has got me to feel more interested in being sexual with my partner. My desire has increased. I'm having new kind of sexual experiences that I've never had before. And I'm feeling an intense connection with this person, even though I don't know. I'm telling him things that I've never told my partner before. I am revealing parts of myself that I didn't even know existed like my sexuality that I didn't know I had even in me any kind of kink or any kind of desire to be sexual in a specific way. And this is keeping me online. And that's what grabbed my attention. It's like there is something happening here that is really different. There is a part of us that we haven't explored because the internet wasn't available. And so that got me to dive really in deep. So that was the beginning for me. Now, as I have this trauma background, I understand what connection is, because couples will come in and they'll say, you know, we don't communicate with each other. And they'll sit on my couch and talk, 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 a lot of communication, but there's no connection, right? And what do we mean by connection? Connection means exactly like we're having right now, the ability to see and be seen, the ability to be noticed. And there is nothing more powerful than that. So now on my therapy couch, when couples come in together, 
they can spend an entire session not talking in the usual way. The stories sit back over here and they turn to each other if they possibly can tolerate that kind of communication of just absolute intimacy of connection. And they are told by me to notice the posture of their partner, the facial expression of the partner, the tone of the partner's voice, the gestures of the partner, and the skin tone of the partner. And when they do that, they'll say, oh, you know, she's sad. And I'll say, what tells you she's sad? Well, she's sad. No, what tells you she's sad? Oh, her mouth is drooping. Oh, her eyes are looking down. And she will start crying because it's the first time she's ever been seen by him. So let's bring it into the world of Jasmine. Of these are your members who have an innate longing to be seen because that's what we as humans long for. And if we've had any kind of childhood neglect or invisibility or abuse, we are not seen, we feel invisible. And that is the biggest injury that we as humans can have because we feel disconnected and detached. So here you are providing a platform where people, members have the absolute opposite experience of that childhood injury, where they just feel seen and heard and the connection is there. And that's the power that you bring. Because I have people, clients, who do webcamming and they come in because their partner finds out and there's infidelity and there's huge trauma that goes along with that because it's a very different kind of trauma when you are doing webcamming as opposed to just porn. But anyway, that's kind of where I'll leave it with you. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. I, I have so many other questions uh, to follow that. One being from your experience, and I would consider you a true expert in the field. You know, I feel like the term expert can get used quite <laughs> loosely these days, but you are a real expert in the field. And what I would like to follow up and ask you is you mentioned that, you know, a lot of times people have childhood trauma, which I think probably we all do to some degree. And many times it, it looks like something like maybe they weren't heard, they weren't seen, um, maybe their needs weren't prioritized. And then they come to this platform and they have someone who is their it's basically their job to care about their needs, basically, and to see them. And mm -hmm. my question to you would be, is that a truly healing experience for the person or is it a Band-Aid? I'm, I'm truly curious. Incredibly healing, incredibly healing. I can tell you that because it's based on scientific research that we know when somebody has had early childhood trauma, the most healing experience they can have is a safe and secure relationship with somebody, with somebody. And it could be a friend, it could be a dog, it could be a religious leader or a teacher, somebody who watches their back for the first time in their lives, somebody who they feel. And that has neurological healing. The brain responds, the neurons that we call the brain becomes rewired in response because the person feels oh, I can let down my guard, this person is safe. And also, you know, what? if they're seeing the same model all the time, there is a consistency, there's a predictability, there's a reliability, and they may not have had that in childhood, right? And so here, the healing happens, and so their brain is driving them back onto the site all the time because they like feeling that regulation, of I'm really safe here. Whereas even in my intimate relationship at home, I may be on guard and hypervigilant, but here I know this person, I know what he, she, they are going to look like, I know what he, she, she, they are going to do, and that gives me a feeling of safety and security. And that gives me a feeling of regulation and my body longs for it, so I'm gonna keep going back there to get that same feeling. That was so beautifully said. I, to be honest, I 
it was said so clearly how deep the healing could be that I I um, honestly almost had tears in my eyes mm -hmm. to know that people are receiving in many cases, a truly deep healing that is sounds like very an old wound. Um, most yeah. of, would you say that most of these wounds that people are, and obviously I think in most cases, this is all subconscious. Like the person is not even aware of what they're getting or why they like it so much. I think they might actually believe that it is just all sexual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also, you want to just be a bit cautious around, I don't want to be labeling all your members as traumatized. <laughs> because right, yeah, of course, of course. But be really careful around that, uh, because many people do not label themselves as, as traumatized, even though they might have had childhood trauma. So I do not want to be labeling anyone around anything. Um, it could be somebody who's had a really healthy attachment and it's just coming there because they, it just feels nice and they're getting the connection, the secure attachment that they're getting there. They may not be able to get or they may not be um, seeking out, outward, outwardly in their own in real life relationships yeah i'm curious you know your thoughts on this because part of the problem not just in this industry but in in many pretty much the the problem with anything that is sexual in nature is that it is extremely stigmatized by society as you know, probably better than anyone else. It's extremely stigmatized. And depending on how you express that sexuality or you express the message or whatever it is, most likely you will face some form of being ostracized or cut off from the group or cast aside, which is, I think we can all agree, very painful for human beings. We want to be included. We want to be with each other. And so people are very quick to hide. For instance, just giving a tangible example, many models feel like they can't share the fact that they're models on Live Jasmine. They have to hide it and just, they tell their friends and family, oh, I work in customer service because mm -hmm. they're afraid that they're going to lose love if they're honest about that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm curious from your perspective, using Live Jasmine as an example, you know, is this just a sexual thing? Like are the members, you you detailed very clearly that many members, they may not know it, but they're coming for something that's deeper than the sexuality. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the fact that these platforms are just sexual and just, um, um yeah Ty, i mean i i really do understand what the stigma is because i work in the sex industry right i'm not a sex worker i'm a, a practitioner but i work with sexuality so i have felt stigmatized too right by being a sex therapist right so i get it and Anyone who goes into the industry, either as a model or as a porn star or as a sex worker, they absolutely and utterly find themselves excluded from their community. And I was very touched because I went onto your site and I watched one, her name is Lords, I think, I watched her interview. And I was very touched by what she said was that she couldn't tell her friends and she made a life-changing move back to Romania, I think it was, because she needed to feel in community where she could feel safe to be all parts of herself, right? Whereas people who do work in the industry really, really suffer with the stigma and the isolation and the lack of connection. And then, of course, also their own intimate lives, their own personal lives, how it impacts on their personal lives, being able to tell a partner this is what I do. And, you know, even if they're a, a an exotic dancer, for example, you know, who takes great pride in their work, how do they let a partner, an intimate partner know that without being absolutely extorted or abused? So it's a very high risk profession to be in. Yeah. And even if, you know, we de decriminalize, which in South Africa we're trying to do, to decriminalize sex work. There is still a huge stigma that is attached to that. And you know, it pains me because I'm an activist for sex workers in South Africa. 
that here are a service that's been provided, just like live jasmine, for you know, mostly for men. And the men always get off scot free in a way. For them, it's acceptable. And it's always been acceptable for men to buy sex. Um, and the women are the ones who are, you know, made into into the scarlet person, the scarlet woman. Why is that? Ah, uh, at we can go back to the Bible. I mean, you can go back to the Bible and you can see that Onan, who was a man, he got punished for masturbating, right? But there was never anything said about women masturbating. There was never any ruling against women being sexual with women just because women weren't ever thought to be sexual. We were never considered to be wanting of sexual or to be sexual. And because I've been around for so long, it really, it, it, it really guts me when I work with students and they're kind of fourth generation that I'm working with. And they still have the same, first of all, lack of information because we don't have enough good enough comprehensive sexuality education. And they still have the same stories of slut shaming women and women still being afraid that, I, I mean, I did a talk recently at the University of Students and they asked anonymous questions. And the most common question that the women were asking is, am I a sex addict? And when I inquired why they were asking that, it was because I've had multiple sexual partners. I enjoy having more than one sexual partner at the same time. This is kind of scandalous and also incredibly fabulous that, that women are finally even asking those questions, right? That they're even engaging in that kind of conversation. So it's a slow, slow change, but women are still terribly, terribly discriminated against. It is true. Um, I wonder sometimes if, I mean, I think most women understand the power that is innately in us <laughs> and that we can potentially have over men. Obviously, I mean, these are billion, billion, trillion dollar industries, anything having to do with sex. Yeah. So there's a market, clearly. And I sometimes wonder if it's this power that is there, but you get shamed if it's used or exercised at all, or mm -hmm. it's almost like a way to keep it under control, I almost feel like, because what would happen if all the way, you know, I think it was in, it's an old ancient or an old story where all the women in the town got together because a war was being fought. And so they told their husbands, we're not having sex until this war ends and the war ended. <laughs> well, what would happen if we all started using that one again? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's been thrown around, you know, that we kind of go back into the times of the idiot to say, let us get some, some kind of movement going. Um, I want to also to, you know, to kind of bring in the uh, the area of of abuse that um, there has you know there's so much abuse that happens to to people and to men as well not just to women and that impacts on sexuality ability to connect and intimacy and sexuality as well and I think this is you know a marvelous platform for men who struggle with their intimacy and their own sexuality to be a, maybe as a result of abuse and trauma in their lives, but abuse of uh, any kind of abuse that they themselves have had, because we don't talk a lot about that, for them to be able to have a safe place to come onto your platform as well and to find some kind of sexual healing. And I do want to talk about the sexual aspect of it because I think that's really vital because when I'm curious around what drove men to um, be with a sex worker for um, for two years and the wife never found out about it and then finds out about it and you know the enormous trauma that she goes through around it and it will be because there are sexual activities that I enjoy that I haven't had the courage to bring to you you know almost like the Madonna horse syndrome but also because I'm I, I'm afraid I'll be rejected or I'm afraid I'll be judged and so here is a platform where I can for full, it's not just sexual fantasies, but it, it may be you know a real your real sexual your your real sexual code of this is how I am. This is what really arouses me, and I'm being forced into a heterosexual situation with marriage, whatever it is. 
people are seldom really honest about their sexual desires or what really arouses them in their intimate relationships because of the, the dynamic and the fear of rejection and the fear of judgment. And that's obviously what the purpose of, of sex workers and webcamers are, is to be able to fulfill the actual arousals, which are really deep-seated. They're not just, you know, it could be a fetish, it could be a kink, that they're not able to exercise anywhere else or not in their own intimate relationship. So there is a huge sexual need as well. Absolutely. And to your point, you know, I have had me- I've interviewed members as well and models, and I have had members tell me that they have a particular fantasy that they are afraid to share with a partner or a date. And it's safer to be rejected by a model or have a model, you know, judge them because that's their fear than to have their wife of 20 years judge them. So they take that risk with the model, but nine times out of 10, they're going to have a positive experience. And then this bond develops because they were able to share that part of themselves finally with someone. Right. That part of themselves that carries so much shame, right? And that they then hide and that impacts on their ability to attach and connect with their intimate partner because the sexual part of them isn't being fully shown or manifested within their intimate relationship. I want to ask you, you know, because we've touched on a few things like this part of them that had a lot of shame and that was so buried. But I think about how many of us have these hidden parts of us in us that because of how society is set up, which is basically, again, very tricky when it comes to sexuality. It's We're only okay with it under certain circumstances. And so we're kind of trained out of um, exploring beyond those circumstances. And if you're really brave, if you do, you know, you're courageous and you'll face the consequences mo- most likely. But I want to know your thoughts on how many of us have these hidden parts of ourselves or fantasies or kinks or sexuality aspects that we don't even know because we are not encouraged to explore ourselves in that way. Exactly. And what is the consequence, if any, of us not exploring that part of ourselves? Oh, goodness. Um, So there was a book that came out a number of years ago called Nine Billion, Nine Billion Thoughts. And they did research by looking at people's Google searches to see what people, yeah, yeah, to see what people were searching and to see the diversity of thoughts and diversity of sexual interests that people really do have as well. So we know that, you know, there is is all of this fantasy world that is happening to people. What happens when we don't manifest that part? So immediately what comes to mind is women in my practice, no matter what the age is, who are pre-orgasmic, who've never been able to explore this, the, the orgasmic potential, either because of early childhood trauma or just because of abuse or total, total ignorance, lack of information, and having partners, and I'm going to talk heterosexually because it's less so with two women together, partners who are ill-informed as well and don't really know about sexuality or women's genitals or an anatomy or physiology at all, and that there is a mismatch that happens over there. So there, there are women who will then present with this part of them, and they will present with, oh, I just really don't have any desire to be sexual. And when I go through an assessment and a history with them, they are very sexual on their own with a toy and are orgasmic alone with a toy, or they are being sexual elsewhere where they are able to be orgasmic with somebody else but not in the intimate relationship or else they are being faithful to their partner and have always just said as we women do it's during a sexual activity and there hasn't been enough time spent to get the woman to become orgasmic she'll say oh I'm fine or don't worry about me or I'm good or that was great and over a period of time she becomes more and more obviously not interested in being sexual because there's no real motivation to to being sexual but she also developed like real a sense of of disconnect isolation depression even and um it, it impacts you know terribly on her when they come into therapy with the story of whatever they're not interested or they have pain whatever their sexual so-called dysfunction they label themselves with, 
And there is a sense that I've never been orgasmic. Actually, that reveal is huge, right? To let the partner know. And he, again, I'm talking heterosexually, will say, you've been faking it all these years? And she'll say, yes, I've been faking it all these years, which is an awful thing for him to kind of find out. And the moment that you actually can get her to a place of buying a, a petrol vibrator, and she'll go home and use this vibrator on her own, there is a, a profound experience in every part of her that finally she's able with autonomy, self-autonomy, to be able to bring herself to orgasm. Whether she does it with a partner or alone, it doesn't really matter, mostly on her own. And so not having that part is, is really some women, you know, they know that this that it's not happening, but they just accept it. And the moment that they do have it, it's like, okay, now I want other, it's like they stand up taller, their posture changes, they work walk in the world differently as women who've discovered a part of themselves and they won't take less, which is really, really important. It changes their lives and the way that they feel about themselves in the world. So it's very important that we do encourage women to find a way to bring out that sexual part of themselves. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's, I really like what you said, you know, women who have discovered a part of themselves and they won't take less. Yeah. That is so powerful. Yeah. After that, you know, you can't, you can't, as I say, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You can't go back, you know, to what it was before. Um, you want to be able to, and then they find a voice. It's like, okay, this is what I want. This is what, but not only in bed generally. So it's very transformative, which is why I've always sold, you know, sex toys. I have a store which sells, you know, sex toys because it's important that clinically I have that and I'm able to, it's part of my education for people who are really needing to be educated around lubricants and around different kinds of sex toys. Um, and that's you know, very important that women have access to that. This has been an incredible interview. Seriously, one of my favorites. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's yes. So very so interesting. Um, I'm curious if there's anything else about this field or this world um, that we haven't talked about, but that you want to share, you think it's important for people to know. Um. I think it's always going to come back to respect, kindness, and compassion for both your models and for your members. Respect, kindness, and compassion. On that note, where can people find you? Um, DrEve.co.ca. I have a beautiful website, and on all the social media platforms, you just follow Dr. Eve, D R E V E dot co.ca for South Africa. Thank you so much <laughs> for inviting me. And thank you for your intelligent questions and really interesting questions for your curiosity. I appreciate that.